Thank you so much. So, this is something a little different, a little fun. Um, the purpose of Diagnosis Live, I'm, I'm spending time here to give you all time to take out your mobile device, your phone, or your tablet, and go into your browser and type in live.rsna.org. And then you'll be given the opportunity to select the course, and the course will be RCRT 2019 Diagnosis Live. Uh, this morning we're going to do abdominal chest. This afternoon we'll do neuro and MSK. Um, you can sign in using any of your social network uh, logins, and I'll, I'll keep talking while you, while you uh, d do that. Uh, the purpose of Diagnosis Live, you know, remember in my talk yesterday, I talked about the idea that we need to be data or evidence driven in how we practice medicine. And um, I will make the argument that we also need to be evidence driven in education. And unfortunately, that's not what we do. We tend to study what we like to study rather than what we need to study. And because of that, we have no way of knowing what, and one of the reasons for that is because we have no reason, no way of knowing what we need to know. And so the idea of Diagnosis Live was to provide evidence driven education. There's another reason why Diagnosis Live was created, and that is many people who are expert in lifelong education have observed that the passive consumption of a lecture, a didactic lecture, is probably not optimal. That when you listen and falling asleep to some people, someone like me droning on on a lecture, people tend to forget. The retention of information on just listening passively to a lecture is pretty low. How many of you, it's probably not true now, but when I was a resident, my, my professors were very mean. Uh, I know now that's not possible at all, but when I was a resident, all my professors were really mean. They would yell at me, you know, how stupid you are, how come you miss that? But I'm going to tell you, how many of you have ever experienced that? Of course not, never here, not, not today. But, but I will tell you something. It worked. I still, to this day, remember cases that I got yelled at by my professor. You know, how stupid are you? you how could you miss that? And I remember those cases very vividly. In a way, that's post-traumatic stress syndrome, okay? But post-traumatic stress syndrome works, all right? Now, obviously, we can't yell at everybody. That's not very nice. And research shows there's another way of embedding emotion to learning that is as effective as yelling at people, and that is competition. Competition, fighting to win a game, seems to work just as well. So that's what Diagnosis of Live is. It's a combination of evidence-driven lifelong learning, and what I mean by that is when you log on, tomorrow you'll actually get an email that talks about what you're good at, what your performance is relative to the rest of the audience, as well as the rest of the world. So it's an example of evidence-driven lifelong learning, but also it tries to introduce competition, gaming. Okay, so for now, I'm finished talking, we're gonna get started here. So most of you, hopefully by now, have logged in, and the way you know that you've successfully logged in is you should be randomly associated or assigned to one of two teams, okay? So, first of all, how many of you are on Team Toon? Raise your hand. How many of you are Team Toon? Let's hear it. Let's say yay for Team Toon, okay? I didn't realize he's old. Uh, he looked very young. He, he's like over 60 years old. Do you know that? Yeah, he, he, he's an old guy. Um, anyway, how many of you are on Team Bird? He looks a little younger. Okay, let's hear it for Team Bird. Okay, so here's how it's going to work. There are two kinds of questions we're going to ask you. The first question is a typical kind of like case of the day. We're going to show an abnormality on the screen. It will show up on your mobile device, and I'm going to ask you a multiple choice question. Select it and submit. Remember, you have to submit or it isn't uh, uh, um, taken in, and you'll compete as a team, and hopefully your team will win. 
The winning team will get a ribbon from the RSNA, so just remember that. And the top 10 individual radiologists will also get a ribbon as, as a winner. All right, so that's, uh, so let's try to practice that kind of question. Uh, Mr. Paul yes. can, can we uh, interrupt you a little bit because of the, our audience, some of, uh, many of our audience not understand how to register into the website. Okay, okay so please. if you look below, there are multiple ways to log in. You can use your Facebook account, your... I, I can explain in Thai, please. Oh, okay. Let me, right. please let me, okay. Uh, for those who are not in the website, not in the game, go to the web live.rsna.org. When you go there, it will be called to register. But the most important thing is that there is no password for username. แต่ต่ำกว่านั้นมาเนี่ยมันจะโหลดช้าหน่อยแต่มันจะขึ้นว่า Facebook Google Plus อะไรเงี้ยครับให้กดเข้าไปตรงนี้อีกทีหนึ่งเพื่อจะรีสิสเพื่อจะรีสิสเตอร์ด้วยโซเชียลเน็ตเวิร์กแทนโซเชียลมีเดียแทนนะครับพอเราจะเข้าไปเนี่ยมันก็จะขึ้นโชว์เซสชันไลฟ์เซสชันของ RSA ที่เป็นส่วนของคุณพอแชงขึ้นชื่อคุณพอแชงอยู่นะครับเป็นอัลบั้มเมลเชสแล้วกดจอยเข้าไปนะครับใครมีปัญหาที่ยังเข้าไม่ได้เรายกมือนะครับเดี๋ยวผมจะเดินเดินไปบอกนะครับ Thank you. That seems to be helping. We're getting more people logged on. We have now 69 people who have logged on. We'll give you. Do people want to wait a few more seconds to log in? Yes. You want you want to wait a few more seconds? Okay. Oh, that's helping a lot. Now we have 84, 85. Good. Well, while people are logging in, we can st the system is very intelligent, so you can keep up. You know, you just refresh your browser and you'll catch up. Uh, I'll leave it to this first question. This is the first type of question, and I'm going to ask you a very simple one. Uh, when was the Royal College of Radiologists of Thailand first established? Okay. And as you can see, we have so far 21 respondents and... Uh, the green respondents are correct and the red respondents are incorrect. And so, so far, um, many of you don't know when your society was established, but we'll find out the answer in a bit. Now we have a hundred people, that's very good. Let's wait for a couple more minutes just to get everyone to log on. Okay, we have over 100 people who have logged on now, so is it okay to keep going? Because we only have an hour, we only have a few minutes here. So I'm going to keep going here, all right? So there's a, how about this, because we do have people who know, if you're having trouble logging in, please raise your hand and maybe we'll have someone that can help them uh, log in with their social networking. But it looks like we have quite a few people, so let's keep going. So as you can see, uh, we have this first type of question, and most of us didn't know the answer, so let's find out what the answer is. When we look at this, we see that most people thought that it was a stat your, your, the Royal College of Radiologists of Thailand was established in 1985, and that's a good guess. The precursor to your society was in that, that but the actual Royal College was formally established uh, in, a diff in, in June 14th, 1995. Okay, so now you know, now you know. There's a second kind of question in this, and that is, a, we're gonna show you an image on your mobile device with an abnormality or something. You can double tap or drag, depending on your mobile device, on the image to where you think the abnormality is, and then submit. So let's practice that. So I have a question here. Please select this gentleman. He was the chief of the first modern radiology department in Thailand in 1928. Who was he? Which of these three people? So select, double click, and submit. You know, it's interesting. You all know this. I, I, I'm very impressed. You don't know when your society was created, but you know someone from 1928. That's very good filial piety. Very good. Excellent. Wow, I'm very imp Is he very famous? Is that? Yes, yes. Oh, is that why? Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. 
Well, you did very well there. Okay, so that's the second kind of question. And you see, and some people got some other people. Most people got it right. All right, so that's excellent. So we all know how to play. All right, so let's start playing. So like I said, this first session, these cases are, are based on 15 years. We do this, we've done this for 15 years. We have hundreds of thousands of observations of this. We've done it many, many times. So these are the cases that we've selected, we expect 60% of the audience to 70% of the audience to get it right. So it's not super easy cases, but not super hard. We expect about 60 to 70. So for Thailand pride, we want more than 60% right, okay? So he, now today, we're this morning session is abdominal and chest. After lunch, we'll do neuro and MSK. So if you're a neuro person or a bone person, don't feel bad that you might not do well this morning, okay? So here's the first case. Oh yeah, we showed the, the right person. Oh, before I do that, I apologize. I, I, I wanna give a, 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 a thank you to the case contributors, especially Drs. Panu, Sousa, and Feinstein. Uh, Drs. Panu and Sousa are from Canada, and, and Kate is from my department at University of Chicago. These are the people responsible for these cases, and I just wanna give them attribution. So here's the first case. This is a patient who presents with microhematuria. What is your diagnosis? Very good. We're already at the 60%. So I'm gonna tell you something. We're all not perfect. We all make mistakes. We are not always right. Many times I'm wrong. I have a lot of respect for people who know this, which is most of you, that's very good. I also have a lot of respect for people who get it wrong because at least you're trying. What I don't like are these people. Okay, because these people are not responding at all. So that's like saying your doctor comes to you and says, I have a patient with microhematuria. Here's a coronal CT. What do you think? And you say, I'm going to go to lunch. I'm leaving. Okay, so I'm not happy with the fact that some people lack the courage to respond. All right, so enough said. All right, but you did very well on this case. So let's look how people did. Obviously, most of you got this right, that this is papillary necrosis. So let's talk about this. As you can see, you all recognize that what we have here in the excretory phase of a CT, an excretory phase coronal CT, that you have abnormal pacification of contrast to where the papilla should be, and that's not normal. Now, the, the appearance of papillary necrosis is very wide, and it depends on what happens to the papilla when it necrosis. Sometimes the papilla will actually slough off, it will go away, and then you have these bizarre flame shapes and kind of things. But most of the time, the papilla, even though it's necrosis, stays within the area, and you get reflux into necrotic areas or regions of the necrotic thing. Occasionally, the necrotic papilla can calcify, and that's the reason why you always want to remember when you see something that looks like nephrocalcinosis, there are three mimickers to nephrocalcinosis. All right, because nephrocalcinosis is, is a metabolic, usually, problem, right? Hypercalcemic or hypercal hypercalceric states. But there are three pretenders to, to, met, to, to nephrocalcinosis. One of them is papillary necrosis. Papillary necrosis can mimic um, nephrocalcinosis. The other, uh, just for interest, the other mimicker is majorly sponge kidney. And the third is TB. So you always want to think of those three before you jump to the conclusion that you're talking about nephrocalcinosis. Very good. Here's the second case. I'm going to first show you a frontal radiograph on a 23-year-old woman coming in to rule out pneumonia. I'm going to show you that. And then I'm going to show you, if it works, 
I'm going to show you the CT and a sagittal contrast enhanced MR. And my question is, what is your diagnosis? See, we have a very brave professor here. We have a neuroradiologist. How are you doing so far? Not so good. <laughs> I have a question. Are most Thailand radiologists generalists or subspecialist? Mostly generalist? Is, is that true? Are, are, are most radiologists in Thailand ge more general or are they subspecialty? Um. Most are general. More general, okay. Yes. So that means you should be good on everything. So we'll see. <laughs> okay, this one people still want to think a little bit about. This also, we actually monitor by the millisecond how quickly people respond. And it actually supports the hypothesis that, that many perceptual psychologists say about radiologists. And that is, if you know the abnormality, you know it immediately. And if you notice, the correct response are always the early responses. And the later responses tend to be wrong. And that's the reason why they say you could look at an image forever, and if you don't get it the first few seconds, you're never going to get it. Anecdotally, many of us believe that. This, actually, this uh, diagnosis of life system was the first to actually demonstrate uh, evidence that that observation is probably true. Okay, let's stop there. Most people have made their response. and. Uh, you know, most people still got the right answer. The most, uh, most uh, prevalent incorrect answer was disseminate histoplasmosis, uh, which is not an unreasonable second guess. That's, that, that's not a bad wrong answer. That's actually pretty good. Um, let's see what we're talking about here. We see obviously we have diffuse randomly distributed nodules in the lung parenchyma. We also have irregular leptomeningeal enhancement, which is usually, we, we, we see that with, with TB. Uh, this is response, this is uh, 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 you know, blood-borne spread of the mycobacteria. As you know, uh, frequently the sputum is negative in these patients, and it's critically important to communicate with your clinician directly on this to, f as a public health uh, uh, priority. Excellent. Okay, this is a woman. This is a, their CT, contrast venous, portal venous phase CT in 2008. This is the same patient, the same patient in 2010. And my question to you is, what is the most likely diagnosis? You're going to learn something today. That's good. See, that's why this is fun. If you're right, great. If you're wrong, even better. You need to learn something. Well, you don't want to be wrong on everything. Then that's kind of sad. But you're in good company. When I show this case worldwide, there's only one country that actually gets this right, and that's New Zealand. The reason for that is New Zealand, I don't know if you know this, the job market is so hard in New Zealand that most radiologists in New Zealand do three fellowships before they can practice. So they're very, they're very well trained. Okay, so uh, we had some trouble with this one, which is not, ex you're in good company. Uh, now most people, you know, the, the most prevalent incorrect answer was cholangiocarcinoma. No, that's not, right. that's not good. No, that, that should not be. It should, you know, you, you might want to think about cirrhosis perhaps. This is an important phenomenon to observe. What we call this is we call this pseudocirrhosis, okay? The important thing to understand here is when you looked at the baseline, you had bilobar, meta bilobar metastases. And then when you have into it later on, this is the effect of treatment for metastatic disease that's intrahepatic. You get treatment, you get retraction, scarring, fibrosis, and it can mimic uh, cirrhosis. 
Um, I, don't, I, I know some people thought cholangiocarcinoma because of the fibrotic retractile, but if you notice here, there's no biliary dilatation. So it would be very brave to make the diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma that's peripheral with biliary obstruction. That's a little unusual. Um, so this is the classic, what we call pseudocirrhosis. Uh, it can be seen in patients who have received systemic therapy. A lot of people f believe that this is specific to treated breast carcinoma. That is not true. You can see this in almost any treated uh, cancer with intrahepatic metastasis with effective therapy. Okay, so we have seen this in pancreas, esophagus, colon. Breast, yes, you see this the most, but this is an important observation, okay, this post-treatment post pseudocirrhosis. Very good. Here's another patient. This is a 57-year-old male with known intrathoracic metastases. My question is, what do you think the most likely primary is? What is the primary cancer from this patient? Okay, I think we got reached our 60%. That's very good. Let's keep going. A few extra. Very, oh, look at that. Yell at you and you all respond. That's excellent. <laughs> okay, so you all got, most of you got this right. That's very, very good. So most of you got this correct. That the most likely is an adenocarcinoma, and that's the answer. Um, many people believe that when you have a cavitary lesion, a cavitary lesion, that means squamous cell. That's actually not true. It's actually more prevalent for metastases to be adenocarcinoma, and that's the take-home message here. Cavitary lesions are not specific to squamous cell. Cavitary lesions can happen, and actually because metastatic adenocarcinoma is just more statistically likely, it's more likely to represent a metastatic adenocarcinoma and of any sort, not just colon, gastric, cervical, pancreas, but true, sarcomas occasionally can cavitate as well as metastatic squamous cell. Excellent. Okay, here's our first touch question. You should see a coronal CT and a uh, ultrasound of the scrotum. And what I want you to tell me is, this is my favorite question I ask medical students at University of Chicago. Where should you first look for nodal metastases? Click and submit. Going to learn something again. That's good. Ooh. Now I'm wondering if the system is working. That will be very interesting to see what the response here is. Whoa. Okay, I'm going to stop right now before it gets worse. Um, <laughs> I'm curious to see, holy moly, uh, just everywhere, I mean, in the lungs, in, in, okay, but, but here's the, okay, so this is the re reason I show it. A lot of people will think, okay, so you know what this is, right? This is some sort of testicular tumor, right? This ha happens to be a seminoma, and that's the, this is the take-home question. You don't want to look in the pelvis. Most of you are saying pelvis, okay? That's not right, okay? Remember, 
the, the lymphatic drainage of any organ follows the systemic, the systemic veins. So when you look at the testicle as well as the ovary, where, do the, where is the venous drainage of the gonadal organs go? Not to the pelvis. It drains up, right? It drains at the level right below the renal veins. And that's where you want to first look. So when you see a testicular carcinoma and the, and the urologist or the oncologist wants to stage, you want to look at the level of the renal veins just below there. That's the first place you look. Yes, it's true. You can go to the lungs, yes, but the first time for nodal metastasis, look to where the systemic drainage goes. Embryologically, the lymphatic system follows the systemic veins. And so if I'm talking about gonadal tumor, same thing with ovary as well. Same, this is a level of look. Don't look at the pelvis. Okay, excellent. All right, let's do one more. Okay, this one, be careful. Be very careful. I have some images on a patient, and I'm asking you, what do you think the primary cancer is? Most people worldwide get this wrong. So, and in Thailand as well. A few people got it right though. After lunch will be better. <laughs> Neuro cases. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So everyone has difficulty in this. And this is, I show this case. Let me see what people said here. So most people thought, yeah, small bowel lymphoma. That'd be the obvious one because you all have committed one of the most common mistakes that radiologists have to protect themselves from. You have committed what we call a satisfaction of search error. How many of you heard that term? An SOS label, satisfaction of search error. Every radiologist are the only physicians in the hospital that will be, should be disciplined enough to avoid this error. Because every other doctor is going to immediately look at the obvious abnormality, which you could see, big, huge, thick and discreet bowel thing. Oh, it's a cancer of the bowel. Oh, probably lymphoma because it doesn't look mucosal origin. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, I'm so smart, all right? But the reason I show you that is not because I know you understand how lymphoma looks. I want you to understand your job as a radiologist is to look everywhere else. The only way you can protect yourself from a satisfaction of search error is to have a comprehensive survey, even in diagnosis of life. So you all saw this huge thing. I gave you that on purpose. How many of you saw that? And how many of you saw that? Okay. When you have that combination, it no longer is lymphoma. Lymphoma does, you can have lymphoma of the gallbladder, but it doesn't look like this. It doesn't present as a polypoid mass. This would be, I mean, anything's possible, but lymphoma would not be the first thing I would think about for a muscular thing. Melanoma is the thing you remember because melanoma loves to go everywhere. It goes anywhere and everywhere. That's why I don't like looking at melanoma with CT. We have to for financial reasons, but I prefer to look at under PET CT because it's very FDG avid. But on CT, especially when the history is melanoma, you have to look everywhere because it can go anywhere, especially the gallbladder. Melanoma is the most common metastasis of the gallbladder. However, that's, it's not the only one. We used to teach residents that if you see a mass in the gallbladder, it's melanoma, a metastasis. That's not true. There are other cancers that can metastasize the gallbladder. Melanoma generally tends to be the most common. Uh, and so this is that. So the reason I show this is make sure your job as a radiologist, you're the only doctors in the hospital that are going to protect 
from a satisfaction search error. You have to be disciplined and look at everything and don't get excited about the obvious thing. Fair enough? Okay. Let's see how people are doing here on, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, scoreboard here. So it's very close. So let's hear it for Team Tune. They are leading. Excellent. But Team Bird, you're, all, you're very, very close. And let's look at the players here. I am not going to attempt to say the names of here, but Matty, raise your hand. Who, 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 who's Matty? Let's give her a... Excellent job. But also, we have other people here, Siri Khan and Best. Let's raise their hands. Stand up. Excellent job. Okay. So again, the top 10 people are going to get a, a, a ribbon as well. So let's keep going. We still have time. Next case. This is another touch question. Where's the abnormality? See, young people, you don't like playing films anymore, do you? You go, show me the CT. I don't, this is, uh, but you know, 70% of radiology work is still projectional radiography, and you can't forget it. And I'm going to tell you something. When I show you the answer, you're going to be very sad. No, you're not going to be sad. Your professors are going to be sad. Because <laughs> this is one of the things you should never, ever, ever miss the, this. No, that didn't help. Everyone is now frozen. They don't want to say anything now. <laughs> okay. Step back sometimes. Step back. Take your mobile. Do a selfie. Go, go <laughs> and take a look. Maybe that will help. Remember what your professors talked about. How do you survey a chest radiograph? What, where are the trap areas? Where are the scary areas that you always should check? That didn't help either. <laughs> okay. All right. That's enough. Let's see where people thought. Okay. So everyone is, no, that's, yeah, this is lung. This is the hilum. That's the liver. Uh, but a few people got the right answer. A few people got the right answer. This is the classic Pankos tumor. Remember? bilateral symmetry above the supraclavicular region, that should be air, that should be lucency, that should not be an opacity. And there's an asymmetric opacity, and that's a Pankos tumor. How many of your professors have shown you this, right? Okay, so enough said. You, you have to be, projectional radiography is not sexy, but it's 70% of our work. It's important. All right. Coronal Axial projection, what's your diagnosis? Very good. Oh, it's split half and half. Let's see if we can get the 60%. It's a race. <laughs> Okay, I think we're going mm -hmm. to miss the 60%. I'm going to stop it here. Okay, let's see what people thought. Okay, so, yeah, so this is a good thing. All right, most of you got the right answer, which is excellent. And also, the most common incorrect answer was 
a good miss. In, in other words, that's obviously the differential. Are we talking about a retroperitoneal uh, liposarcoma? Are we talking about uh, large angiomyolipomas? Uh, the, 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 hard, the, the key question, and it can be very difficult, no question. This is kind of an unfair one. Uh, the, if you responded each of those two ways, I think it'd be reasonable. The key here is these are reniform. They look like kidneys. They're abnormally enlarged, but they're reniform. So you have bilateral reniform, fatty kind of masses. Then you lean towards multiple angiomyolipomas. And when they're so prominent like this, then your diagnosis is tuberous sclerosis. Excellent. You did a very good job. Another chest case, young female, young female with increased shortness of breath. What is your diagnosis? Oh, very good. Now, some people are saying, hey, wait a minute now. They're cheating. They're talking to each other. That's not cheating. That's collaboration. Weren't you listening yesterday? No, I'm serious. Does that mean when you go to the reading room in your daily practice and you see something, you don't ask for opinions? You don't ask colleagues? You don't Google things? You say, no, I can only give you interpretation based on my honor of my own. No, of course not. So go ahead. Collaborate. But here's the thing. You may be collaborating with the enemy. They may be on another team. Okay, so that's the only thing. No, collaboration is fine. I like that. That's what you should be discussing this. Okay, most people got this incorrect. Excellent. Uh, what did most people... Okay, that's not... Yeah, okay, so, yeah, obviously, the, the key here is a young person. This is a young woman, you know, you have all these thin-walled cysts, normal parenchyma intervening. Uh, now, remember, this can also be associated with tuberous sclerosis, too, so people want to make sure they do that screen. Excellent. This is a hard case. Only New Zealand radiologists got this correct. In other words, over 60%. This is a very, I show this case every year at the RSNA, and I can't get my Americans, my North Americans, to get this one right. And I keep telling them, I'm going to show it to you next year. And they still miss it. 32-year-old male with abdominal cramping. What is your diagnosis? And I checked, you do have this disease here. So that's not... It's not like sarcoid or something. Yeah. The only problem about diagnosis live sessions is if someone just walked into this, they say, everyone's taking a nap. What's going on? Yeah. It's very quiet here, but that's good. Okay, so, okay, this is a hard case. Um, all right, I'm going to stop it here. I don't think we're going to reach 50%. What did most people think this was? I mean, the most common, the, mo the, the most prevalent response was correct, but everyone else was kind of split across, which is very, very good. This is classic celiac disease. I know that's, I mean, you do, I know the Chinese get celiac. Is there celiac disease in Thailand? It, it, what is the, it, it, is there a lot of celiac disease in Thailand? Do we know? No one knows? Okay. Maybe this was really unfair. Well, then very good for those of you who got it right. You were doing very good reading. Uh, what, this, what celiac disease, what you have, the findings here are pretty classic. The, the first one is what we call the reversal of fold patterns. Remember, the proximal small bowel, the jejunum, should have the proliferation of folds. And if you notice in this case, this looks more like ileum. The proximal bowel looks like ileum, whereas the distal bowel has folds. It looks more like jejunum, and we call that a reversal of, of findings. Now, the 
the reason I show that is you may not get celiac disease in Thailand, but this reversal pattern is also important to observe in other conditions. All right? So this is a condition where you have effacement of, of the thing. So malabsorption any sort of malabsorption. So for instance, milk or other kinds can cause this pattern as well. The other, example, the other thing you find is abnormal wall thickening, which unfortunately is not specific to this, but it is an observation. But this is actually generally very specific for SPRU, celiac disease. And that is, if you see mesenteric adenopathy, look how low attenuation these mesenteric lymph nodes are. They're very low, okay? And that's, that, that tends to be very, very specific for celiac disease. So it is an enteropathy. Um, again, you may not see a lot of celiac disease in Thailand, but you will see malabsorption. And so you, malabsorption has a similar kind of reversal of pain. Um, the the, the uh, celiac disease patients need to be corrected because chronic inflammation and insult there is associated with subsequent adenocarcinoma as well as lymphoma. So it needs to be followed and treated aggressively. Another touch question. Point to where you think the abnormality is. Very good. I show this case because at home, my residents tend to miss this the most. It, when it comes to, when they do their comprehensive survey for patients with cancer, this is what they, they wouldn't miss this, this is pretty obvious, but, but this process, but you clearly do not miss this. You all saw this correctly. Well, some people thought a kidney was abnormal, but that's not true. Uh, but most of you got this correct. And what this is, is clearly omental carcinomatosis, okay? Um, I find that young radiologists tend to miss early omental peritoneal deposits. And the reason for that is the sensitivity of CT to detect omental peritoneal disease is actually very poor. Uh, I do a lot of intraoperative ultrasound. And so it's amazing to me when I see very subtle nodularity, this is obvious, this is gross, you know, four plus. But you really want to see, if you see any subtle nodularity in the omentum or peritoneum, call it. And the reason for it is the sensitivity of CT is very small, is very low. When I go to the OR, subtle nodularity, widespread carcinomatosis. We tend to lag. Uh, we're, we tend to be insensitive to omental disease on CT. So if you see any nodularity, you should raise the possibility in the right context. Very good. Coronal and axial chest, CT, what is the most likely diagnosis? I see a lot of collaboration, which is good. Oh, excellent. Very good. Very good. Okay. We reached the 60%. All right, so let's see how people did. Yeah, most people got this correct. Excellent. Okay, so this is APPA, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Do you have this in Thailand? 
You, you get aspergillosis? All right, so that's why you, so, you did so well here. As you know, this is a hypersensitive reaction to aspergillosis. It colonizes in the, 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 the fungus is in the bronchi. Patients present with wheezing, typically uh, elevated IgE and eosinophilia, and you see classic bronchiectasis and mucoid impaction, the so-called finger and glove appearance is pretty specific for this context. Excellent. I'm going to show you another point question. Where is, this patient comes in with acute, a severe, severe acute abdominal pain. Where is the abnormality? Here, this might help. This is what I consider this as an abdominal radiologist, one of the most satisfying diagnoses to make. Don't you think? It, it, it's one of the most satisfying diagnoses to make. Hopefully that's a clue. Almost there. It's a race between the green and the red. Uh-oh. I might. Uh. Okay, I'm going to end it there. It's pretty close. Let's see what people were people pointed. Uh, no, that's the that's stool in the colon. Um, yeah, but 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 a lot of you got the right answer here. Uh, this is a very satisfying uh, diagnosis. If you've ever actually experienced this when you're on call. It is dramatic how painful this is, this epiploic appendagitis. It can mimic, uh, I don't know, dissection. It can mimic appendicitis. It can mimic diverticulitis. It can mimic a surgical abdomen. And that's the point. This is the role, this, the reason I think this is one of the most satisfying diagnoses is because the radiologist can stop a surgeon from operating. They can reassure the patient that yes, I know, patient you know, is, has terrible pain, but this is going to be self-limiting. This will respond to supportive care and resolve within a few days. You see this infiltrative case. Now, that's nonspecific on its own, right? Because you could have any sort of inflammatory, inflammatory process, illicit inflammatory process, you know, have this uh, soft tissue infiltration. But the, the clue is its location, and in the center is this nidus of fat. So this is inflammation of uh, the, the appendage, the colonic epiploic appendage. And the etiology, who knows, but some people think it might be some, some acute infarction of it or some sort of vascular insult. The important thing is to, be, to recognize this because the radiologist can really help out. It's a very satisfying diagnosis. I'm going to first show you a radiograph here. This is a 56-year-old male with increasing shortness of breath. I want to show you the radiograph. And then I'm going to move over to axial CT because you young people hate radiographs. I know, I know. Um, now here's a tricky question. What is the least likely diagnosis? What is the least likely diagnosis? Excellent. Very good. Oh, you guys are too smart. Excellent. All right. And that's the take home message here. Uh, yes, er everyone said, yeah, this does not look like plain old congestive heart failure. The ta it, it doesn't really matter whether or not it's mesothelioma. This tends, out, tends to be mesothelioma. The key take home message is 
Be very wary, be very worried about unilateral loculated pleural fusions. That's usually a bad sign. That's not a good sign. So that's a take-home message. I, I don't care if you think it's mesothelioma or whatever. That's not the important thing. Uh, now, in the case here, if you notice here, there, there are not a lot of plaques, and that's common. In mesothelioma, actually only 25% of cases do you see the calcified plaques. But the important take-home message is not the fact that this is mesothelioma. The take-home message is unilateral loculated effusions are worrisome, and you should always think about something there. Okay. Here's another one, 58-year-old male with weight loss, what is the most likely diagnosis? What is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, since we only have a few minutes left, I'm gonna, we're going to make this a turbo round really fast here. So I'm going to stop here because, unfortunately, most people got this wrong. And that's, this is a hard one. This is the take-home message here. Um, uh, again, though, the most common response was correct. The key observation here is we teach, we tend to oversimplify adenopathy. How many of you were taught an abnormal lymph node is greater than a centimeter on its minor axis, right? I mean, people are taught that, right? That's an oversimplification. You all know that because when you look at inguinal lymph nodes, right, or level two submandibular lymph nodes, they're huge and you don't worry about them, correct? Because they're chronically, they're reactive, okay? So we already know that just a simple size criterion for lymph nodes is an oversimplification. I'm going to give you a pearl that GI radiologists have known forever. And that is, for some reason, the gastrohepatic ligament, you should never see any nodes. I don't care how small. Four millimeter node in the gastrohepatic ligament is abnormal. Now, it doesn't mean it's cancer, right? You could have cirrhosis, you could have chronic liver disease, you could have, you know, whatever. It doesn't mean it's cancer. but. Next time you go to the re go on in your practice, look at the gastrohepatic ligament. You won't see lymph nodes there. So any time you see a lymph node in the gastrohepatic ligament, no matter what its size, it is abnormal. All right, and the classic cancer when you see that is a distal esophageal lesion. Fair enough. Okay, but the take-home message is not, oh, I got the diagnosis of esophageal carcinoma. The key point is, when you see a lymph node of any size in the gastrohepatic ligament, that is abnormal. Very good. 75-year-old male, now we're going to go really quick here because we only have a few minutes. 75-year-old male with incidental finding on the chest radiograph, what is the most likely diagnosis? Speed round. This is a chance for the teams to, to get some points. Forty-five seconds is all I'm going to give you. And there's no penalty for guessing, so you might as well. We'll just laugh at you. Okay, five more seconds. Well, that helps. Okay, enough. So, most people got the right answer. Excellent. Okay, so this is rounded out, Alexis. You see the mass-like lesion, which is always worrisome, but you see it's, it's associated in but in a thickened pleura, and you have the swirling vessels, enhances, secondary to chronic uh, pleural inflammation. We, we, in the U.S., we see this with a lot of asbestos. Okay, this is a young baby who had a contrast-enhanced head CT. This is a KUB, an abdominal radiograph, 12 hours after the contrast head CT. What is your diagnosis? No one got this right. 
No country, no one gets this one right. And so far, you're doing very well. Actually, extraordinarily well. Less well. Yeah, do you get, are you going to make it? Let's see. All right, we're done with time. Didn't quite get it, but did very, very well. Yes. So what this is, you never will see it this way. You'll see it on MR. You'll see it in ultrasound. But I want to show you this because this is a better way to teach residents. Think about the three adjectives. Bilateral, reniform, enlarged. Bilateral, reniform, enlarged. There's only one thing that is, and that's autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. And so you'll never see this. You will never see this. You'll see it in MR. You'll see it in ultrasound. But I show you this because this is easier to remember. Bilateral, reniform, enlarged, autosomal recessive polycystic disease. There's nothing else in the differential in this age group. Okay? Excellent. 71-year-old female with left adrenal mass. I'm going to show you this. This is the non-contrast CT, the left adrenal mass, 40 Hounsfield units. This is portal venous, 100, delay, 90. And for those of you who can't do mathematics really fast, the absolute washout is 83%. The relative washout is 50%. What diagnosis do you favor? And be careful. Why would I show you this? Think about this. Why would Dr. Chang show you something you learned as medical students? Because what you learned is wrong. Okay, we're running out of time, so this is going to be the last one, last chance. So, okay, this is good. Most people miss this, but, I, but there is one correct wrong answer, and I'm going to say you all got it right. Lipid poor at adrenal adenoma. That is your classic teaching, so you should feel good. Your professors should feel good. The problem is you're wrong. And the reason for that is, and that's why I show you this, it's a good case to end with. It takes about five years, I find, for something that's first described in the literature and then validated by multiple repeated studies that validate the observation before it actually gets to the general knowledge. Okay? So that's why you should have gotten this wrong. You should have said adrenal adenoma, lipid poor adrenal adenoma. But the point is, and the thing I need to tell you is, that's an oversimplification. It turns out, the, the observation here, you don't have to throw out what you learned. If there's brisk washout, yeah, there's a good chance this is a lipid poor adrenal adenoma. But the key point you have to add to what you were taught is look at the measurement on the portal venous. If it's high, and now there's some controversy depending on the Asian literature, the U.S. literature, and the European literature, okay? What do you use in Europe? 85? What, what's your threshold? 85? Okay. I use 85 because I want to improve sensitivity. In the U.S., we use 90, or 90 to 100. 85 is reasonable because it improves your sensitivity. The key point is if on portal venous, the, adre the, ad the adrenal mass is 85 or above, there's a good chance that this is a pheochromocytoma. There's a very good chance. In fact, some of the papers suggest that if it's over 100, it's probably a pheochromocytoma and not a lipid poor adrenal adenoma. So this is the classic teaching. Remember it. You don't have to throw it out. I just want you to add one more thing. Look at the portal venous. If it's 85 or above, say, you know what? You might want to check urinary catecholamines. You might want to get a blood test. You might want to check for a pheo. All right? You guys did great. Give you all selves a, a, a round of applause. But let's give the applause first to the winning team.
The winning team is Team Tune, all right? So let's give you some applause for Team Tune. Come over here afterward and get your ribbon. And for the top 10 players, let's get the top 10 players here. Let's give them a round of applause. These are, these are very hard questions. These 10 players should be very proud of themselves. The professors should be very proud. Also come up and, and get your ribbon. Did you guys like this? Was this fun? No, you didn't like it? Was it okay? All right. Well, if you liked it, come back after lunch. We're going to do it, but this time for neuro, uh, neuro and MSK. Thank you very much. You were very patient. Take care. Don't forget your ribbons.